What's up, guys? Michael here to talk about Dune. The story is legendary, saturating pop culture in a way few other tales ever have. Some of its elements, like the massive sandworms, have become sci-fi staples, which seem to pop up everywhere. Star Wars also uh, borrowed from Dune liberally in its world and themes. The book is renowned for being dense, leaving readers with plenty to unpack. But for all the conversation around Dune's ideas and epic world building, there's decidedly less said about the actual narrative. And when people do get into the nitty gritty of the story, they mostly talk about the seemingly cliched lead character with his seemingly cliched lone savior arc. But the truth is actually far more complicated and far more interesting. Rather than regurgitating worn out tropes, we'd argue that Dune is actually commenting on storytelling itself. And viewed this way, it has a whole lot to say about our own reality. So seal up them still suits and get ready for a deep dive into Dune. And of course, spoilers ahead for the entire Dune extended universe. But before we get into it, I wanted to tell you guys about Wisecrack's podcast. Uh, they're like our videos, but they're audio formed and a lot longer with a bunch of great hosts. Now, if you want to hear more about our favorite movies from classics to recent releases, check out Show Me the Meaning, where host Austin, Ryan, and Raymond, plus a bunch of great guests, uncover all the deeper meaning hidden beneath the surface of our cinematic favorites. Now, for a breakdown of everything going on in the cultural zeitgeist, we got Culture Binge, hosted by Serby and myself, where we use current events as an occasion to analyze what's going on in our culture. They're both great. I think you'll love them. So check them out wherever you listen to podcasts, subscribe to them on iTunes or Spotify, and also check out our Wisecast channel on YouTube to get alerts about live streams and watch video versions of all of our podcasts. Now, back to the show. To set the stage, let's time travel back to the prestigious 1966 Hugo Awards for Sci-Fi in which Dune was voted Best Novel. Interestingly, that year's award ceremony included a one-time category, Best All-Time Series. Many of those nominees remain very culturally relevant today. And if we take Best All-Time to mean influence on the genre, we can see some clear sci-fi trends that were percolating right when Dune was born. For example, most of these series look at the formation of empires or dynasties, like Barsoom, where John Carter turns a nomadic tribe of Martians into a royal dynasty. And all of them unquestioningly feature genetic essentialism, i.e. eugenics, as best embodied by Lensman's genetically perfect space cops. And they all have protagonists that are exceptional men single-handedly triumphing over evil and being valorized for their achievements. Like Foundation's Harry Seldon, with his unmatched genius and visionary plan to preserve humanity. What what this shows us is some foundational tropes of the sci-fi genre, tropes which Dune, at first glance, seems to abide by as well. To explain, let's get into a lore dump. Dune's galaxy essentially runs on space feudalism, where upper-class houses rule entire planets at the behest of the Emperor, who rules the entire galaxy. Houses collect the fruits of their planet's labor, pass it up to the Emperor, and they keep a little for themselves for the trouble. While the Emperor has the most power in the galaxy, there are also other organizations throwing their weight around. Much like the church in the era of European feudalism, Dune has the Bene Gesserit, a quasi-religious sect of seemingly mystical women. The Bene Gesserit are engaged in a 10,000-year-old selective breeding program that essentially aims to create the ultimate extra human. They hold great but subtle political influence throughout the galaxy. That includes supposedly primitive planets where they've seeded myths and legends about themselves. You know, so they can potentially leverage their power there in the future. One of these planets is Arrakis, where the action of Dune unfolds. Dune follows Paul Atreides, heir to one of the great houses and trained in the mystical Bene Gesserit ways by his mother. His family is ordered by the Emperor to go rule over the dangerous and barren Arrakis, which happens to be the galaxy's only source of spice, a key resource. The spice must flow. But this setup turns out to be a trap, and a different great house betrays Paul's family and takes over the planet. Now, Paul finds himself essentially living as an outlaw amongst the planet's oppressed indigenous people the Fremen. But Paul's extra-human abilities align eerily well with the Messiah myth from the Fremen religion. I remember your Gom Jabbar. Now you'll remember mine. I can kill with a word. And his word shall carry death eternal. 
to those who stand against the righteous. And as his abilities grow in potency, Paul ends up leading the Fremen as their prophesied messiah. Rallying the Fremen around the future promise of a lush, safely inhabitable planet, Paul leads them in a revolt against the house that betrayed his family. The book ends with Paul not only in charge of the Fremen, or even just Arrakis, but the entire galaxy. And how can this be? So people aren't exaggerating about Dune being complex. That complexity doesn't just come from the sci-fi of it all either. Where those all-time best series from before solidified many fundamental tropes of the sci-fi genre, Dune's actually doing something much more complicated. And it all comes down to Paul's character arc. See, when he assumes the role of messiah to the indigenous peoples of Arrakis, he's not just stumbling into this comfy place of hero worship. He knows about the messiah myth. He also knows that the Bene Gesserit, his mother's allies, seeded it into Fremen culture via low-key mind control. When Paul finds himself a fugitive on a foreign planet, he's suddenly left without authority or social power for the first time in his life. And in order to gain some of that back, he manipulates the Fremen into worshiping him. The sleeper has awakened! If you're thinking, hey, that's kind of messed up, it's because it is. It's pretty straightforwardly colonialism, like when the Spanish and Portuguese invaded South America, bringing Christianity with them. At the time, colonialist missionaries supplanted Christian myths over similar existing indigenous myths. They also folded what existing beliefs they could into the Christian faith. This is called religious syncretism, i.e. the fusion of two or more religious traditions. The missionaries continued to prime the South American population to further invest in those myths over time. And the missionaries that came after held an ever-increasing sway over the population. Side note, it's no coincidence that in Dune, the Bene Gesserit that see the myths are literally called the Missionaria. Anyway, many of these real-life missionaries are even held as saints now, like Father Subirana, a Spanish missionary in Yoro, Honduras that apparently did a miracle and made it rain fish on the starving town. Turns out a natural weather phenomenon makes it literally rain fish in Yoro annually, which is a bonkers topic for another day. However, Father Subirana still gets the credit via an annual town parade. In Dune, Paul Atreides employs the Bene Gesserit's colonial myths for his own purposes, to insert himself at the top of the Fremen society. This directly reflects the ways in which myths are used in the real world, often to elevate the few and subjugate the many. And Dune's author, Frank Herbert, isn't doing this by accident. The text is highly self-aware. Paul's ascension to galactic dominance isn't framed as the triumphant hero's journey. Far from it. By the end, Paul's becoming cold, uncaring, and calculating. He's traded his ties to humanity in order to gain extra human powers, which at this point include a full-blown higher state of consciousness. He can see the entirety of time, and he knows for a fact that his actions will lead to a horrific galactic crusade with billions dying in his name. This bums Paul out, but apparently not enough to try to fix things. The deed is done, and the blame rests firmly on him. Throughout the story, he sees flashes of the upcoming carnage, but never takes sufficient action to stop it. This probably has something to do with his childhood. See, Paul's been raised knowing that he was destined to rule and to wield power over people. All of his schooling, his training with various experts, was to prepare him for this inevitability. His entire life has been defined by this, and he has never known any other perception of himself. You will make a form Duke. Add his Benny Gesserit mother to this, constantly telling him he's special and destined for great things. Like the ultimate helicopter parent of a Harvard-bound Viola State champion who also just solved cold fusion. She told him he was special and took every step to make sure he'd live up to that expectation. The aristocracy, whether by feudalism or by the royal right to rule, were told that they were the only people who were capable of ruling. They perpetuated this myth into their children and everybody else for that matter. We also see it in that particular blend of Western civilization's colonialist racism. This credo drove people to believe that their country had the obligation to teach supposedly uncivilized countries how to behave. We continue to see echoes of this today in the notion of American exceptionalism or other Western nation building. You can check out our recent Rick and Morty video on the topic. 
Ultimately, whether it's medieval or modern, the purpose of these stories is the same, acquisition and maintenance of power. Dune, with its houses and prophecies, essentially clones this ethos while adding a sci-fi flavor. We ourselves will see a slight problem within House Atreides. Oh. Paul is defined by his sense of inherent exceptionalism. Buttressed by his own grandiose self-perception, he's perfectly comfortable misleading the Fremen and using them to take the galactic throne. Paul experiences plenty of doubt throughout Dune, but he never questions his right to rule. He is sculpted by the systems of Dune's universe, and especially by the stories that are used to justify them. In turn, he sculpts the universe with new stories of his own. We Fremen have a saying. God created Arrakis to train the faithful. One cannot go against the word of God. It's in this interconnectivity, this blend of world building and narrative, that allows Dune to criticize the tropes of typical sci-fi. Instead of parroting storylines from the past, Dune looked critically at the foundation of the genre and saw mirrors in real world oppression. Once more, it saw the way the stories that justify these systems of oppression also seep into the way we conceptualize our future. This duality is infused throughout Dune itself too. If you look at the individual details, Dune's narrative and world building seem to endorse colonialist, aristocratic, and eugenical viewpoints. But when we view Paul's internal downfall holistically, it becomes clear. Dune is actually asking us to consider if the victories won in early sci-fi stories are really victories at all. Because arguably, earlier sci-fi engaged with ideas less critically. Headier fare like the Future History series or Foundation were mostly operating from a place of post-war idealism. All stories, of course, reflect their author's biases, but these series seem explicitly written to perpetuate a certain worldview. The protagonists of these works are all lone savior types, confronting big obstacles. What's more, they're commonly the people who invented the solutions and the only ones capable of instituting them. They see problems in the universe and make changes to try and solve them. Dune, however, depicts a universe where all of the political, social, and religious systems were created hundreds or thousands of years ago. The characters are working within these systems, not trying to implement new ones. As such, despite all the big sci-fi ideas, Dune's universe and the systems that underpin it are much closer to how our real world functions. Systems like colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism were established long before any of us were born. We're raised within the confines of these systems, with all the resultant biases and blind spots. Our perceptions of the world are defined by these systems in ways we can and can't change. Fittingly, Herbert once said that his aim with Dune was to highlight the pitfalls in blindly following a single charismatic leader. To that end, he explored the way stories work in our own reality. Narratives have always been an incredibly powerful way to communicate ideas. We tell stories to ourselves to define who we are. We tell ourselves stories in order to live. And we tell stories from history to help us avoid the mistakes of the past. But stories, Dune warns us, can also be fuel for destructive forces used to justify and reinforce unfair power disparities. In this way, while Dune has been seen as yet another installment of the sci-fi tropes of its time, it's more fair to view it as an active critique rather than a celebration of them. However, as much as stories can hurt, they can also teach and inspire. Arrakis will become the center of the universe. Released into the chaos of the 2020s, we're primed to learn the right lessons this time. Either way, its message is profound. The stories we tell ourselves have power, even if we're not always willing or ready to listen to what those stories are really saying. But what do you guys think? Is Dune an incisive commentary on the dangers of charismatic rulers lording over empires? Or does it mostly parrot the same sci-fi tropes it sought to critique? Let us know what you think in the comments. Huge thanks to our patrons for all your support, and don't forget to check out our podcast. Hit that subscribe button like you're a careening sandworm in the desert, and don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Later.